Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Lynn Fries in Geneva. In this series, we report on talks centered around changing course in economic development, specifically comments made by panelists here in Geneva at a recent book launch for the Handbook of Alternative Theories of Economic Development. The handbook represents a landmark in the field of economic development. This third segment features clips to key players from the field who share their respective insights into the battle for the kind of inclusive, sustainable development presented in the book. We now go back to the UN Library book event, moderated by book co-editor Jayadi Ghosh of Jawaharlal Nehru University. What you do matters. So the critical thing really is how do you change what you do and how you do it? How do you get that structural transformation? Mm -hmm. And one of the concerns is, of course, that there are various types of constraints to that kind of structural transformation. Uh, C.P. Chandrasekhar, who is uh, the Dean of Social Sciences in my university in Delhi, Jawaharlal Nehru University, uh, he has a chapter in this book which is on planning. And um, it's interesting because planning has become a bad word, right, in so many places. But in fact, none of the countries that actually developed did it without some kind of planning. So could I perhaps ask you about these constraints and how planning still matters? Yeah. <clears throat> Today, partly because, of course, the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union, the fact that planning came to be identified with highly bureaucratized societies uh, with a central planner determining without an iterative process how uh, policies are going to be devised and implemented. Uh, it appears that it's something which has lost its relevance, uh, really cannot return. But what is often forgotten in this kind of a discussion is that, um, uh, that, there are, that, that, that in countries which were actually market economies, which chose systems of organization in which private decision making was central to the dynamics of the system, that in these countries there was for a long period of time, immediately after the experience of the Great Depression, which seemed to bring, bring sort of starkly out up front the fact that capitalism is a demand constraint system and not a supply constraint system and that what you need is Keynesian type of demand management policies and you were going through the period of the great American celebration, the golden age, in which you had uh, public expenditure, you had the welfare state which was an automatic stabilizer. The whole idea was capitalism had resolved its problem of cycles because of the fact that it had discovered the ability of the state to intervene to manage demand that at that point of time, there was from across the ideological spectrum, as it were, a set of arguments which particularly came up in the context of development economics or the problem of, of dealing with underdevelopment, that actually you can have significant supply constraints which need to be relaxed or done away with in market economies. And uh, if you don't do that, in fact, we, in, in India, we had a very famous economist uh, in the 50s, BKR Virao, who said Keynesianism is not relevant to India because there are so many supply constraints that if the government starts spending in order to be able to address demand constraints, you'd immediately get inflation because you'd run up against a supply constraint in agriculture, in infrastructure, etc. So if you look at it, we've had a range of people. You had Arthur Lewis, you had Tim Bergen, you had uh, Rosenstein Rodan, of course you had people like Maurice Dobb, K Kaleski who came from a more radical tradition. There were a range of people at that point of time who actually spoke of the need for some kind of development planning. And here the idea of intervention was not that you needed intervention in order to deal with microeconomic uh, market failures, you know, uh, which come because of the fact that you have public goods, absent markets, uh, uh, externalities of certain kinds, etc. Uh, but really you needed it in order to deal with grand macro scale market failures. Uh, and I think there were, there were, there were two kinds of uh, sort of uh, issues which are highlighted. One, of course, that there existed a set of sectors which had economy-wide externalities, for example, infrastructure, where you needed such large, lumpy, you know, capital investments, and uh, these were very long gestation projects, which were very risky, 
rates of return were not guaranteed, and therefore if you left it to the private sector to undertake these investments, that's not going to occur. But on the other hand, the absence of these kinds of investments, the absence of roads, highways, ports, communication, etc., would actually hold back development so that unless you resolve that kind of a supply constraint, you're not going to be in a situation where you would be able to launch and development even within a market framework. And therefore what you need is in some sense uh, intervention by the state which is planned intervention in order to be able to ensure the emergence and growth of these sectors which are crucial from the point of view of addressing the, uh, the fact that there are sectors which have economy-wide externalities and must be put in place as a prerequisite for development. And the second feature of, of that discussion in development planning was essentially the idea that you need a certain degree of investment coordination, that you really cannot have a situation in which you have atomistic decision makers, each of whom does not know what the other is going to do, who then make sort of guesstimates of what is going to be the profile of costs and, and prices in order to generate some profile of profits and then decide whether to invest or not. You actually need a certain degree of investment coordination and uh, you needed this coordination, it was argued in particular, to address two kinds of constraints. One was the wage goods constraint. Uh, these were countries in which you had a pretty backward agriculture which was actually the sink for much of the population in terms of uh, finding employment but there weren't obviously enough jobs to go so you had unemployment, underemployment, uh, disguised unemployment and all of these issues which are dealt with in the development literature and the idea was can we think of ways in which we can have institutional change like land reforms which people hardly speak of today even though the most successful developing countries had land reforms either directly or under occupation like South Korea and the other of course was uh, the need to actually ensure that there is increases in productivity in the agricultural sector with gains being distributed in an appropriate way in order to generate a domestic market as well as to ensure the availability of wage goods as development occurred so that inflation is kept at bay. And the other constraint which investment coordination was expected to address was uh, the, the, the capital goods constraint, that these were economies which because they didn't see industrialization, particularly those which were under colonial rule for a long period of time, did not have the capital goods to be able to employ their labor force in full. And they were faced with constraints of transformation through trade so that they couldn't ex import these capital goods in adequate measure. So you had to find ways in which domestically you generate investments in order to be able to relax the capital goods constraint. And this was what the feldman marlin obis model was all about. Now, the one last question, of course, which arises is that is, is this all because of the fact that we made the assumption that there weren't really possibilities of transformation through trade, that you couldn't export some set of things in order to be able to import whatever you wanted, wage goods, capital goods, so that these notions of supply-side constraints was based on an underestimation of the role of trade. The difficulty with this, of course, is that you did have reason to be pessimistic about the possibilities of transformation through trade, terms of trade effects, uh, the fact that you are primary producing economies, etc. But more importantly, even if you look at economies which manage to export, you actually find two kinds of tendencies. One, you have the successful South Korean case where you had huge investment coordination because of the seeing power of the state in order to identify the most dynamic areas into which you need to diversify in order to be able to export. And on the other hand, look at the oil exporters, which actually could get large amounts of foreign exchange, but because they didn't have investment coordination, didn't diversify their economies and remain completely oil dependent so that when oil prices begin to fall, they're faced with a crisis. So investment coordination was quite crucial in many senses and need not occur only in countries in which you have social, complete social ownership and a centralized bureaucracy managing the economy. You need it even in market economies so long as you come to realize that markets are characterized not merely by micro failures but grand macro failures which need to be addressed. I think. One of the themes that has been taken up a lot and which is also very much in this book is the notion that what's happening in society is not separate from the economy and that social policies are as integral to, the pol to a strategy of economic development as purely economic policies. This is something that in fact uh, Katya Huyo from Unrest has also done a lot of work on. So can I ask you a little bit about this Katya? Unrest was founded in 63 based on the conviction of two famous economists, Gunnar Mödel and Jan Tinbergen, that the social dimensions of development uh, required more attention and also a kind of better uh, e analysis by economists and, and better social indicators for measurement. 
One of the key concerns the, the handbook addresses is that the current mainstream economics is almost inclusively concerned with poverty alleviation when they, when they talk about economic development. And this has led to an understanding of social policy as a poverty reduction instrument, which is problematic, as I will try to explain. As Chandra also already mentioned, Keynes understood the importance of welfare policies and of wage bargaining systems because he was not assuming an ideal world of full employment and perfect markets. So social transfers financed through progressive taxation were crucial instruments for social development and for macroeconomic stabilization in this framework. However, the neoclassical paradigm that has gained so much power over the last four decades has more problems actually to integrate social policies into the framework. First of all, it's because given the assumptions of perfect markets, information, and full employment, there's less need for social policy from the first place. And second, the costs of state intervention in terms of growth and efficiency are deemed substantial. However, from a development perspective, social policy is a lot more than residual approaches or palliative interventions. It's a transformative policy instrument which has multiple functions, and UNRIS has put that into a kind of conceptual framework of transformative social policies, which has a function for production in terms of uh, creating and improving productivity through human capital, macroeconomic stabilization and demand stabilization, redistribution, very important, but also reproduction in terms of distributing the burden of care within the economy, and also, of course, the traditional role of protection against not only life cycle contingencies like uh, old age or sickness or maternity, but also market risks. And these market risks are not seen as something that is an external shock. It's, it's really part of how our economy functions, and we are more in an equilibrium of underemployment and, and uh, unemployment rather than in a full employment uh, situation. Social policy has featured very much as a development instrument in many of the late industrialized such as Germany or the Nordic countries. It has also been very important in the so-called success stories like the East Asian miracle or also with regard to the more advanced countries in Latin America. However, you know, those social policies that were so important in, in East Asia have often been neglected and not really been seen as a crucial part of the success of these developmental states. And for example, also when you look at Latin America and you look at the more advanced countries, these countries have been the pioneers in universalizing social services and introducing social security already more than 100 years ago. Targeted cash transfer programs and private pension plans cannot play these four complex roles in terms of production, reproduction, redistribution and protection. They're just too small and basically not able to being used as an economic policy tool and they also do not provide sufficient social protection. We are calling for a more comprehensive understanding of social policy and an integrated perspective and to see, as Yayati mentioned, social policy and economic policy as something that needs to work in tandem. And this would also better reflect the spirit of the 2030 agenda, which once more calls for an integrated approach and basically uh, combining the different pillars of sustainable development, the economics, the social, and the environmental pillar. We're going to break and be back to report on Q&A in the next and final segment. Special thanks to the panelist and moderator of this discussion and to the UN Library as host of this Geneva book launch for the Handbook of Alternative Theories of Economic Development. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.